Carbon-14 in Egyptian history is a subject I've been interested in ever since I was uh, uh, briefly a graduate student and had to quit because of financial reasons at the University of Chicago. Um, and the reason it's interesting uh, partly is because, let me see if I can get this fastened down somewhere. Um, we have, um, if you look at carbon-14, uh, there, there are two competing uh, major chronologies, and there's, uh, of course, minor variations of both of them. Um, uh, one of which is centered around um, trying to explain uh, the exodus, and the other one of which is centered around uh, um, uh, tree ring calibration curve. And if, um, if the standard history is correct, then we should get, of course, this is, this is an idealized one-to-one uh, -one relationship. And for some reason, it is not pointing. Um, but um, you'd get an idealized one-to-one -one relationship between uh, uh, carbon-14 dates and official Egyptian history. Whereas uh, the uh, history proposed by uh, Donovan Kerrville, among others, has uh, uh, will have some very interesting weird uh, bends in it, and in fact, this kind of thing is at least theoretically uh, falsifying. Now, if let's say uh, Kerrville were turn to turn out to be correct, uh, the modern history would look. Uh, something like what's in the blue dots, which is uh, pretty close to normal here. Uh, but uh, coming up to uh, a, uh, a curve that, that's somewhat irregular here, but, but fairly straight, and then suddenly doubling back on itself at the Sixth Dynasty, and I haven't illustrated it, but it would also double back at the second and first dynasties. And finally, there would be a double back down here as well. Now, that wouldn't make it impossible. It's possible that the calibration curve actually does look something strange like that. Uh, but it would make it um, at least somewhat unlikely. And um, I had at one time intended to get a whole bunch of short-lived specimens and do a bunch of carbon-14 dates on them and see which way they lined up because I'm interested in finding out what the truth of the matter is and uh, that's more important to me than any particular favored theory. But um, that does give you an idea of the kinds of things I would be looking for. So I was really pleased to find out that somebody else had done the work for me. Uh, Bronk Ramsey, Christopher Bronk Ramsey et al., and there's several other people in the uh, uh, list, um, wrote a paper called Radiocarbon-Based Chronology for Dynastic Egypt. And it was in science. And the, uh, there's a bunch of supplemental material, which interestingly enough, the article itself is behind a paywall. Uh, but the supplemental material, at least as far as I can tell, is not. Um, and, of course, I went and looked at both of them. This is the abstract of what they had to say. The historical chronology... Now, of course, he is not doing it from my personal perspective. Um, that is, he's not looking at all of the dates that uh, could be looked at uh, with special interest to where there might be overlaps. He's just uh, looking over the general history and trying to, trying to make a, um, a judgment call on where um, Egyptian history should uh, wind up. The historical chronologies for dynastic Egypt are based on rain lengths inferred from written and archaeological evidence. These floating chronologies are linked to the absolute calendar by a few ancient astronomical observations, which remain a source of debate. 
We used 211 radiocarbon measurements made on samples from short-lived plants together with a Bayesian model incorporating historical information on rain lakes <coughs> to produce a chronology for dynastic Egypt. So they were trying to produce a chronology, not paying much attention to which chronology it was, or assuming that, uh, that one of the standard ones was more likely to be the case. Um, a small offset, 19 radiocarbon years older, in radiocarbon levels in the Nile Valley is probably a growing season effect. Our radiocarbon data indicate that the New Kingdom started between 1570 and 1544 BC and the reign of Djoser in the Old Kingdom started between 2691 and 2625 BCE. Both cases are earlier than some previous historical estimates. So if you take their article at face value, at least uh, the abstract, um, uh, and you take the standard biblical chronology, then it, um, you basically, uh, you pretty much have to put um, uh, the exodus during the era of Tutmos III or Amenhotep II. Um, he starts out, and by the way, I'm not going to read the whole article for you. Um, e Egyptian historical chronologies have been underpinned by relative dating derived from a variety of sources. Building on the surviving evidence from Manetho's Egyptica, written in the 3rd century BCE, and the king list dating from the Pharaonic era, generations of scholars have used written and archaeological information to check, and in some instances revise, the sequence of kings and the lengths of their reign. Undocumented years at the ends of some reigns create an overlap, and I think that should be an overlap, and uh, we caught uh, uh, science in an uncharacteristic error, and uh, between successive monarch monarchs, creating uncertainties of the order of a few years. And I, no, I, I, I stand corrected. They did have it right. Undocumented years at the ends of some reigns and overlap between successive monarchs create uncertainties of the order of a few years. The placement of this relative chronology on the absolute calendar time scale, however, has been principally based on the interpretation of a small number of ancient astronomical observations in the Middle and New Kingdoms. Um, and I'm not sure why it ate that. A, se a selection of the access accession dates, first regnal year for the A, Old Kingdom, B, Middle Kingdom, and C, New Kingdom, derived from this research. The marginal posterior probability, and that's, uh, I just didn't correct that. that that's a hyphen, of course. Uh, are shown in gray with their corresponding 95% probability ranges indicated below, and we'll see those in a little bit. Red historical dates from Shaw, blue from Hornung et al., and green from Spence. The accession intervals used for the model are from Shaw, and the corresponding distributions using the intervals from Hornung et al. are shown in figure S4. Oh, my. You know what it did? It stole that. It sto uh, that's, the, that's what it is, the Middle and New Kingdoms, MK and New K, respectively, and is therefore considerably less certain. Many of the relevant celestial and lunar phenomena repeat at regular intervals, giving different possible chronologies, and their timing is dependent on the location of the observer, which may also add to the uncertainty. In addition, much work has been done to synchronize the chronology of Egypt to that of neighboring civilizations, particularly with Mesopotamia, which also has a rich and detailed historical record and astronomically based datums. However, precise absolute age synchronism between them are only possible in the late New Kingdom. Radiocarbon dating, which is a two-stage process involving isotope measurements, and then calibration against similar measurements made on dendrochronology, dendrochronologically dated wood, usually gives ages, age ranges of 100 to 200 years for this period, 95% probability range, and has previously been too imprecise to answer these questions, or to resolve them. Here we combine several classes of data to overcome these limitations in precision. Measurements on archaeological samples that accurately reflect 
past fluctuations in radiocarbon activity, specific information on radiocarbon activity in the region of the Nile Valley, direct linkages between the dated samples and the historical chronology, and relative dating information from the historical chronology. Together, these enable us to match the patterns present in the radiocarbon dates with the detailed, uh, details of the radiocarbon calibration record, and thus to synchronize the scientific and historical dating methods. So, what they did was obtained short-lived plant remains from museum collections. And the idea is that that way it's not wood, which, you know, if a tree grew and you had the inside of it, it might be 100 or 200 or 500 years old um, by the time it's actually cut down and used. And then it might even be reused because there's not a lot of wood in Egypt and so reuse of wood would uh, be fairly common. So you might easily have things that are older in the radiocarbon years than their historical context. So they're trying to use stuff that only grows for one season. Seeds, basketry, plant-based textiles, plant stems, fruits, that were directly associated with particular rains or short sections of the historical chronology. We avoided charcoal and wood samples because of the possibility of inbuilt age. We also avoided mummified material because of concerns about contamination from bitumen or other substances used in mummification, in the mummification process. So you don't want to date the mummy. Now, if you were, were going to date it, you probably would want to date the linen around the mummy, which would make more, uh, more sense. And human material, because of the possibility of riverine or marine components in the diet. Well, what difference does that make if you eat fish that are, that are eating algae, that are getting their, some of their carbon dioxide from uh, carbonate through which the river runs, the fish will date older, uh, and therefore, if you eat the fish, you date older than you would have if you were eating, let's say, grain. So that's the difference there. And if you ate half fish, you'd be half older. That's what it boils down to. We selected samples according to the security of their archaeological context. In other words, they wanted to be sure that they knew which dynasty this all came from, and particularly which reign. It was really helpful if there was a little notation saying, you know, the 40th year of uh, King Amenemet the uh, second. But in making chronological associations, we were reliant on the judgment of excavators and curators and on the integrity of the collections themselves, because many of the excavations took place in the 19th or early 20th century. So they're saying, basically, we tried as hard as we could. But nobody can guarantee any particular sample. So in a few cases, we sampled different short-lived plant remains from a single context. So they can do an internal check. Fourteen of the ancient samples were actually from the first to second millennium CE and that were thus clearly intrusive. In other words, if they're from thousands of years after these people lived, well, obviously, um, like, for example, if it was a rat pellet, but it was, you know, dates um, to the 1860s, well, it's probably a rat that got in there in the 1860s rather than uh, an actual date of the pharaoh itself. Um, we do not consider these further. Another small set of radiocarbon dates show offsets of a few hundred years, typically younger than expected. Um, and they basically write this off as uh, tomb contents are often disturbed after being sealed. And so some grave robber dragged in a seed accidentally with him. And that's why it, it gives you a younger uh, material. Where we have multiple samples from single context, the internal agreement between the dates is usually good, except for two measurements on the same sample, where we suspect contamination that are not included in the, in the analysis, and see table S1 for details. And if you want to find out exactly which ones those were, you can go to that supplemental material and dig through their massive uh, table. 
Now, in one case, they even had, uh, although the internal consistency is satisfactory, seven dates from one single 19th dynasty tomb are about 200 years older than the historical age ascribed to them. And that's uh, specifically Ramses I and Seti I. And you're going, wait a minute, how do you do that? I can see how younger material gets in, but it's kind of hard to see how you'd bury a lot of older material and for it to be consistent, you know, one or two dates maybe. In this instance, we have concluded that there must be an archaeological problem, unspecified, and have excluded the dates from the model. So what you're doing is you're actually watching sausage being made. Um, they look perfectly good, but they're just too old, and so therefore something's wrong with them, so we're just going to have to ignore them. We included all of the dates, 188 in total, whether or not they appear to be outliers in, our, in our analysis. We have 128 from the New Kingdom, 48 from the Middle Kingdom, 17 from the Old Kingdom. At least um, this is done better than some in that they have given you all the data they have, and in fact, if you go to that supplement, you will find all of the excluded dates as well, so you can look at them. Uh, the majority of the measurements have calibrated age range that overlap with the conventional historical chronology within the wide error limits that result from the calibration of individual dates. Now, they also got environmental information from a series of 66 AMS measurements on botanical specimens. Basically what they did was they, they got a whole bunch of specimens that were gotten from plants that grew in Egypt and that were taken out of circulation in an exact given year. And they compared it to the, um, the chronology uh, from tree rings. And they noticed that there was a 19 year offset. And um, let's see if um, plants in Egypt sampled the atmosphere at a different time of the year. And this is the ex explanation they give is because they grow during the winter, and during the winter there's less carbon 14 than you would think. Uh, and it's, it's higher in the summer, apparently because of atmospheric mixing. The uh, size of the effect agrees well with the estimated peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of the seasonal fluctuations in the radiocarbon activity in the atmosphere of up to four per mil. What this is saying is that there is a built-in error of about 20 years either way that cannot be gotten rid of in any other, w uh, in any other way. Uh, just depends on when this uh, plant was growing and what it was, what it was doing. Um, and that in Egypt, it tends to date older than the, uh, than the surrounding era. era. So, uh, for the, and they actually have a reference to somebody else that's found the same effect. And their single parameter um, will, uh, Here's, here's what happens. If you don't take that into account, you get uh, an overlap that looks something like this. If you do take that into account, they, the peaks are very close to the same time. And that's why they're arguing that you need 19, 19 and a half years to, to, uh, uh, to properly correlate these plant remains with tree rings. So when they do their calibration, they're going to, they're going to use that. And you won't see much of the calibration itself. I think there's one slide that will show you that. In the uh, Middle Kingdom, the conventional and early historical chronology is largely based on a single observation of the heliacal r rising of the star Sothis. So the Middle Kingdom is, before this radiocarbon stuff, is primarily one uh, date, and otherwise it's kind of free to float around. Uh, different interpretations of this and other astronomical observations are possible, depending on the supposed point of observation, and a chronology that is about 40 years younger has also been put forward based on more, uh, on, more on lunar observations, and in fact there's one that's about two or 300 years younger, 
uh, that's been put forward uh, and then vigorously disputed. The radiocarbon chronology favors the earlier interpretation, but it cannot be used to decide conclusively between these interpretations because they're just not that accurate. Um, the results for the Old Kingdom, although lower in resolution, also agree with consensus chronology of Shaw, which is the oldest of those three chronologies that he talked about earlier, but have the resolution to con contradict some suggested interpretations of the evidence, such as the astronomical hypothesis of Spence, which is substantially later. So they feel like they can eliminate certain ones. Um, or the reevaluation of this hypothesis, which leads to a date that's earlier. So they're saying, no, Shaw's got it right. Both interpretations of the astronomical hypothesis of Spence are incorrect. The absence of astronomical observations in the papyrological record for the Old Kingdom means that this date set provides one of the few absolute references for the positioning of this important period in Egyptian history. Thus, the radiocarbon measurements provide a coherent chronology for ancient Egypt, uh, which is in good agreement with some earlier attempts to tie down the floating chronology. In contrast, a previous large-scale large radiocarbon study gave dates that were substantially earlier than expected ages for the Old Kingdom and dates that are earlier than expected at Tel El Dabra. Uh, I'm sorry, that's uh, Daba. And uh, I should have put that up in a... In a Smaller case supra, that's uh, iron is what it is, or whatever the Egyptian equivalent is. Um, these discrepancies probably reflect the choice of sampling for dating. Many of the sites in ancient Egypt were densely populated over long periods, a notable exception being Amarna. In addition, some resources such as wood were in short supply. The use of scarce resources can result in incorporation of older organic materials, and we've been over that. Uh, and the robbing of monuments also provides opportunities for later organic material to be discovered. We were able to reduce but not eliminate such outliers by selecting only short-lived plants from secure contacts. So they've still got outliers in their, in their data. Despite these precautions, we've still found a significant number of young outliers among the dates measured, which we accounted for by using Bayesian outlier analysis. And so they've, they've taken all of the precautions they can um, to try to get good data. The confirmation of a small regional offset will need to be considered in the calibration of all radiocarbon dates from the Nile region. So what they're saying is if you do more dates, you're going to have to work with that 19-year offset. Um, however, other people had larger offsets, and uh, so they're saying the small size of this offset implies that previous studies that have seen much larger offsets are probably due to sample selection or context. Um, and then the radiocarbon-based uh, chronology for the dynastic period allows direct comparison to the radiocarbon records of pre-dynastic sites in Egypt and those from the neighboring regions of Libya and Sudan. So they're talking about the chronology uh, looking at uh, Egyptian state formation and the wider Mediterranean region and sub surrounding regions that rely on linkages to Egypt. And so they're talking about uh, uh, now, they, now they get into the question of the uh, Minoan eruption of Santorini. But they don't really deal with it very much. They just kind of mention it going through. And, um, and so they're hoping that this particular piece of work will be able to uh, form an anchor point. And here's the way that they show their data to begin with. Joe, sir, you'll notice that uh, the red bar, which is the Shaw chronology, is better than either the blue or green, which are out here. Uh, Sneferu, the same. Khufu, 
and you go through this and you know that looks pretty good actually and the difference here is for example that um, uh, this looks like Teddy which is a six early sixth dynasty pharaoh uh, is significantly earlier in radiocarbon dates than, say, Sesostris I or Amenemet I or Mentuhotep II, which would seem to, if you take that at face value, eliminate um, uh, a rearrangement of the style uh, that Kerrville would have. Um, now you look at this and it's a little bit messier. This is actual dates. Um, and this is the calibration curve, and of course, um, put on a, a real time. You notice there's a little bit of scatter. Uh, the New Kingdom has quite a bit of scatter here. Um, it's a little bit harder to to say for sure, but still, it's a, it's on the calibration curve pretty much. Now the one thing that I'm a little disappointed in is that we don't have more dates from um, uh, Sixth Dynasty because Sixth Dynasty and Twelfth uh, 12th Dynasty should be parallel in Kerrville's arrangement and and uh, you'll notice that if you look at the dates, the second and third, second and third, this is Joser. Um, and this is the third, and then going to the fourth, and then there is one from the fifth, one from the sixth, one from the eighth, and that's it. And then we go straight into the eleventh. So the, da the dating in the area that I'm the most interested in is extremely sparse. Um, but still, if you look at it, the, da the dating is older for the 6th and 8th dynasties than it is for the 11th, and, uh, which is older than the 12th, which really doesn't fit uh, the Kerrville's hypothesis well. Um, and then I went back and I pulled all of the original data without filtering it and just plotted it out. And it's a mess. Um, these are the, the, the modern dates that they ignore, which they probably are justified in doing. But even if you eliminate those, you're still looking at dates that spread all the way across. Now this would be, if you took the standard interpretation, this would be if you took Kerville's interpretation. And you'll notice that there's only three dates there, and they're kind of going in different directions, but you see you have dates for the New Kingdom that are way out here too. And so I couldn't look at this data and, and eliminate any hypothesis. I, I suppose that you could perhaps, it certainly doesn't look quite as neat as the, as the graph they have in the, in the paper itself. Um, after reading that, in one, I come back to this, I'll, in one case, although the internal consistency is satisfactory. So this is something that passed all of the other tests. Uh, seven dates from one single 19th dynasty tomb are about 200 years older than the historical age ascribed to them. You know, it doesn't bother me, for example, if I'm doing a test on potassium to say you can't have hemolysis. But if we've been careful not to have hemolysis and we've drawn the blood through a large enough needle to where you wouldn't expect anything to happen and we're still getting crazy potassium uh, measurements, that bothers me because it means that you don't have a test that really has much independent predictive value. Um, I would much rather have an answer one way or the other. I really don't like this, where it's just kind of all over everywhere. Um, 
Uh, and what about that Santorini stuff? Well, the Santorini stuff is kind of interesting. Um, uh, in the same issue of uh, science, uh, Bruins wrote Dating Pharaonic Egypt, and uh, he says, Ancient literary sources of Pharaonic Egypt con constitute the historical cornerstone of time in the Eastern Mediterranean region during the Bronze and Iron Age. In other words, we're stuck with kind of the literature. We're not. Historical chronologies for ancient Egypt are based on abundant but fragmentary written sources, and various chronological interpretations exist. Radiocarbon dating has the potential to verify these interpretations. Yes, it does. And then he goes on to discuss uh, Ramsey's article and stuff. And um, the enormous volcanic eruption Santorini in the Aegean Sea during the late Minoan A, 1A period, is a key stratigraphic time marker in the eastern Mediterranean region during the second millennium BCE. Because you have Santorini stuff, and it comes to a certain point. Uh, in, it comes at a certain point in your archaeological uh, excavation. That, oh, here's the ash from Santorini. And so obviously that fell uh, everywhere at the same time. That makes it easy. Um, but a vexing time difference exists of 100 to 150 years between archaeohistorical dating and radiocarbon dating of the eruption. And we're going to see that figure in just a minute. Concerning carbon-14 dating, how do the new results for dynastic Egypt relate to the Minoan Santorini uh, eruption. The most precise radiocarbon date of the eruption is 1627 to 1600, obtained by wiggle matching from a sequence of carbon-14 dated trees from an olive tree found on Thera, buried in Tephra. So this olive tree was killed by the eruption. Uh, we know exactly, you know, we know the bark date then it has to be the eruption of Santorini and if we go back during that, uh, that back in that olive tree, uh, there are carbon-14 dates and then variations that match uh, the calibration curve at that point. Um, so they have this Precise measurement of 1627 to 1600, somewhere in there. Radiocarbon dates from the archaeological site of Thera, Akroti, Akrotiri, in Thera, on short lived plant remains related to the Minoan Santorini eruption yielded an average date uncalibrated of 3350 plus or minus 10 years before the present, which uh, uh, you need to calibrate, but uh, probably would calibrate to somewhere in that range. Remarkably similar carbon-14 dates were obtained from Crete on animal bones found at uh, Palacastro in the late Minoan 1A context with volcanic ash from the Minoan Santorini eruption and related, related tsunami deposits. 3350 plus or minus 25. Now, that's, um, the other one was 3350 plus or minus 10. So that's pretty close. Um, along the promontory in 3352 plus or minus 23, which is also pretty close, at the inland archaeological site. By comparing these carbon-14 dates with the new radiocarbon-based chronology for dynastic Egypt, it emerges that the Minoan Santorini eruption is older than the carbon-14 dates, both calibrated and uncalibrated for the beginning of the New Kingdom. And we're going to see the figure in just a minute. Um, but what it's saying is that this actually erupted during the Second Intermediate Period, not during the New Kingdom. However, according to archaeohistorical dating, the eruption took place during the New Kingdom, around 1500 BCE. The discrepancy between the two dating methodologies is also reflected by the two alternative dates for the late Aegean Minoan uh, 1A archaeological period about 1700 to 1650 by carbon-14, and 1575 to 1480 according to archaeohistorical dating. The two deviating chronologies for the late, a crucial late Minoan 1A period, during which the Santorini eruption occurred, so that one has to be very careful not to mix dates from one methodology to the other. Wait a minute. I thought they were supposed to be measuring both measuring history. You have to be careful not to mix the dates from one methodology to the other. 
as it may lead to inaccurate archaeological and historical associations. So it looks like not only is there a problem here, but it's like the solution is to have two compartments, one archaeohistorical and one carbon-14. Um, that doesn't sound to me like a really good method. Tel El Daba, a situation uh, a, a situated in the eastern Nile Delta, is a key archaeological site having a detailed sequence of phases associated respectively with the Middle Kingdom, the 13th Dynasty, the Hyksos period, and the 18th Dynasty. So this is a site that they can say, oh, this part was in the lower part, is in the Middle Kingdom. This part here is in the Hyksos period. Uh, well, this part is the 13th dynasty, and then the Hyksos period, and then the 18th dynasty. So we've, we should be able to kind of nail this together. From the radiocarbon dating of short-lived plant material from many archaeological phases of Tel El Daba, a um, graphic overview of the calibrated carbon 14 results after sequencing was presented in relation to the stratigraphy. Comparison of these carbon-14 results with the carbon-14 investigation by Bronk Ramsey et al. gives rise to a problem. Phases D1 to t uh, Tel Daba are associated with the beginning of the New Kingdom, dated 1530 to 1480. However, the calibrated carbon-14 range for these strata is 1720 to 1640. In other words, the carbon-14 looks older than the historical dates. Um, which is much older than the results by Bronk Ramsey et al. for the beginning of the New Kingdom. Hence, a time difference of about 90 to 170 years, depending on who's counting, exists between the two investigations for the beginning of the 18th dynasty. And there's their figure. And you see, this is the 12th dynasty. That's the Middle, uh, middle Kingdom. And these are the phases. And here's where the Santorini uh, eruption happens late Minoan in the second intermediate period. But here's where it happens at uh, Tel El Daba. And you can see there's quite a bit of difference between the two. Do we have an answer for that? Well, not according to either of these people. What is erroneous here? The carbon-14 dates by one study or the other? Or the associations between the Tel Daba archaeological phases and dynastic history. Maybe they've got the wrong levels associated with the uh, 13th dynasty and the Hyksos and so forth. Um, as the carbon-14 results from uh, Tel Daba are systematically older by about 100 to 200 years in the Egyptian historical chronology. So all of that carefully constructed Bronk Ramsey stuff is dis uh, disagrees with the carbon-14 dates at Tel El Daba. Now who's right? Uh, the last possibility seems unlikely given the coherence between carbon-14 dating results from multiple archaeological sources. On the other hand, Tel El Daba has detailed archaeological linkages with the Aegean and the Near East. Therefore, Depending on what happens with Tel Adaba, it's not just Tel Adaba, it's also the rest of the Near East and the Aegean, that is Greece and uh, Troy and all of that. Therefore, not only Tel Adaba is involved in this enigma, but the Middle and Late Bronze archaeology of the Aegean and the Levant as well. Now, this, um, he says this uh, particular paper is a great step forward, but much of the second intermediate period, including the Hyksos period, was not included in the above investigation as secure samples are rare. I'm sure that's true. The Hyksos were not noted for building much of anything. Uh, given the enigmatic carbon-14 dates from Tel El Daba, a uh, key site in relation to the second intermediate period, uh, and the beginning of the New Kingdom, it would be very important to conduct systematic radiocarbon research of multiple source samples from the 13th Dynasty and the Hyksos period. 
So I said, we need lots more dates. I would like to see also lots more dates from the 6th dynasty. Um, and from the first intermediate period, although sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between the first and second, so that you may have the same problem that you have with the uh, Hyksos period. Uh, moreover, carbon-14 datings of other Middle and Late Bronze Age archaeological sites in the regions will enable association of archaeological strata with the new radiocarbon dated Egyptian historical chronology, which may lead to a solution of the complex multidisciplinary problems in establishing a chronology for the second millennium BCE. So maybe this data will help, but it's, it isn't obvious exactly how we're supposed to go with it. And with that, um, I will uh, uh, entertain comments and questions. Okay, let me, because uh, it's probably faster to do it this way. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm not sure which, uh, you know, th this is a wide bar, so uh, I guess 1615 is kind of the center, more or less. And this one over here is more like 1500, maybe 1495. And uh, again, I don't think anybody would insist that, uh, you know, they've got it exactly right in that. The, the, the eruption was by radiocarbon directly somewhere around 1600 to 1630 in the, or 40, and they picked the date of 16, whatever the one they gave there, 1623, because of correlation with uh, of this wiggle matching of this um, olive tree. I, I think they said 1600 to 1623, if I yeah. remember but correctly. It, but somewhere yeah, in there. Somewhere in there. They, they, they got three years of uh, famine in China, and the wiggle matching suggested that it was the result of this eruption, and that was dated endochronologically in 1623. Oh, so, you know what? We <coughs> wanted to have you on uh, where other people can hear you. That's my mistake. When we were, um, I was in Santorini um, about seven or eight months ago, and we had uh, a lecturer there from the from Scientific American, who gave us a date of, I believe it was 1623. It was, it was certainly somewhere very close to that, based on a match with um, a period of uh, drought or um, poor crops in China. The China, the China date was dendrochronological, and it came to 1623, and that fell right within the, the, um, the range of the radiocarbon uncertainty. So they, they were telling us that they knew within a year when the Santorini eruption occurred. And it matches this, this graph here, the, the, the one to the left, which is, I presume, right in the middle of the Hyksos. But I, um, and I think it had something to do with the exodus. Um, or uh, obvious, there, there, but I, um, how, d how close is the Hyksos dated? I mean, can, can you move both the orange lines and the blue lines, or are you stuck <laughs> with having to keep one of them constant? Well, okay. Those two orange lines belong together. But the second intermediate because period... Because I don't really think that Santorini erupted twice. I, I don't think it did either. It's only erupted once recently. But the second intermediate period in the yellow matches the Hyksos in the blue. Doesn't it? Does it not? That that is correct. And and the, and the, uh, the well the second one. This one right here is uh, the one you're talking about. Um, is the uh, uh, is in the New Kingdom, 
This one is in the, in the Hyksos era. Yeah, but if you go up to the yellow, it's also in the Hyksos uh, according to radiocarbon. That is the second intermediate period. It's the Hyksos. Yeah. Um, but in Tel Adaba, it's interesting that it, it ha it, uh, the carbon-14 date uh, apparently is in this, uh, in this range as well. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's a problem. <laughs> there's a problem, and it's, uh, it's a big one. And um, it's one reason that I think that it's, uh, it's not a good idea to uh, abandon a theory over one date. Because uh, I'm, I'm not willing to abandon the theory that there's only one eruption of Santorini, uh, and we'd have to abandon that theory if we were uh, if we were going to abandon theories over one date. Uh, the uh, the situation is complex, and as you can see, when you actually you know I just I I was stunned when I when I just took those things and then put, uh, put the dates of, uh, uh, you know, Amoeba, the, f the, the second according to the article, and then according to Kerrville, and just plugged the numbers in and then plotted it. I didn't even look at what was happening until when I got done, and then all of a sudden I go, wait a minute, what's going on here? Because they're scattered all over. So the, um, the radiocarbon dates in yellow, uh, or say D3, D2, and D1, are supposed to match the archaeo-historical dates in blue, D3, D2, and D1. I mean, the whole thing is shifted over about 200 years. Yeah, you know, one of the interesting things is that that same about 150 to 200 years is is uh, being shown in uh, in the bones from the city of Nineveh. Is there a relationship between those two? I don't know. And uh, I'd dearly love to see, you know, what kinds of dates we get for Ashurbanipal and, and uh, 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 for Sargon and Sennacherib and all of those people. Uh, and uh, there's a guy behind you who wants to speak. And, and it's... Uh, you know, I am tempted to say, well, they've just got it all wrong, except that um, this looks like uh, it's partly supported by radiocarbon dates as well. And, and that's the confusing thing is because you shouldn't be able to do that unless there's something special about Tel El Daba that uh, maybe it was getting, well, let's see, it would have to be higher content of carbon-14 in, uh, in its atmosphere if it was uh, offset more recently. So uh, let's, I, I guess the kind of the take-home message of this is that uh, carbon-14 is not as accurate as we think it is, at least not in its present form. Um, question, and since I'm not that familiar with this subject. I assume it's been done, but has uh, geochemical signatures been checked throughout the region on the alleged Santorini ash layer? Do they all match up, and how closely do they match up? Uh, they have been checked in some places. My understanding is that they did a, they did a geochemical match to um, Uh, to uh, the Greenland ice core in particular. But whether they've been matched to all of these other things, uh, you know, I, you may be right. We may be assuming some things that uh, we shouldn't be. Uh, it's just it's hard for me to visualize maybe Thera going off in one place and then uh, Tel El Dava getting hit by another volcano 150 years later. And everybody thinks it's Santorini, and it really isn't. Um, it's a possibility, and I, I, you know, if if you have lots of money, I'm sure that there are people <laughs> there are people who would use it to, to do those kind of analyses. 
I'm, I'm assuming it has been done, uh, and, but I don't know. It would be nice to see the, the references for you're, it. You're absolutely correct. It, it would be really nice to see the references because the fact of the matter is we are, you know, running partly blind here, and we're assuming that somebody has done all the work, and obviously that isn't necessarily the case. So I, I'm not sure what to do with this material. Um, I, I thought I'd have a nice, neatly tied up uh, talk that would give you a, a, a secure feeling one way or the other. And, and from the first thing that I'd read, why I thought, well, this kind of uh, does in at least the Corvillian rearrangement. It doesn't do some other ones in, but it does that one in. Um, but I'm not so sure now. The, the paper that you just presented to us is, in fact, the source of those dates in the yellow blocks starting with? Uh, I, you know what? I don't think so. Where, where did the dates that you just presented to us go? Uh, and I'll tell you why. is because if you look at the dates, let's, let's go back a little further. Um, if you look at the dates that they have here, um, well, this has most of it, I think. Um, if you look at it, you have Mentuhotep, you have this, this is 12th Dynasty, 12th Dynasty, 12th Dynasty, 12th Dynasty. Um, and then it goes, I don't think they have any 13th Dynasty material. I don't think they have any history, uh, uh, Hyksos material. All they have is 18th Dynasty. So they had to get that data from someplace else. Now, they probably got it from literature, and it's probably all legitimate and stuff. But uh, in fact, uh, because I happen to have it, let me do something else here. Um, supplement. Yeah. Here's a supplemental material. And. Uh, and we'll zoom in on it a little bit because that's awfully small. Uh, in. And uh, let's just scroll down here. And you say uh, Amenemet, and then uh, that's 12th Dynasty. And then 12th, 13th border. And then uh, 17th is one date. That would be Hicks. Uh, no, that's early anti Hicksos. But that's just before the 18th. 17th, 18th border, which would be the you know, first year of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Amos, and then 18th dynasty. So you have, you have very few of these you know, 18th dynasty and one plastered right up next to it. And then between that and the 13th dynasty, there is a great gap. So those, those, those could not have been. Um, uh, where is it? that was down here. Yeah, there. Um, those dynasties there could not have been from that paper, period. Because the 12th, 13th dynasty would be right in here. I mean, even if you allow the 13th dynasty to be this big, there's only one or two dates in there. And then the 17th dynasty is right here. So the Hyksos is entirely missing. So all of this D3, D2, D1, that has to be from another paper somewhere, or another set of papers. You know, you look at these, and, you, and they're all so nicely drawn, and then you then you start to ask, well, you know, where'd they actually get that stuff from? And you find out that the, uh, that the answers to those questions are not as straightforward as you might think. The Santorini did erupt. Uh, I, I, think, <laughs> I think most people are willing to say that, yes. <laughs> and when it did, it, it devastated the, um, the whole of the ancient Near East. And that can be archaeologically spotted um, very much like the Mount Mazama eruption can be in, spotted in, anywhere in the in, uh, north, northwestern United States. Right. 
So, you know, it shouldn't be that hard. And why it is that hard is not clear. 200 years here is a lot. Yeah. And uh, 200 years is enough for people to be able to tell by carbon-14. Even if you allow for that 19-year, uh, you know, that's peanuts compared with 200 years. It's not going to do the job. Well, this has the exodus occurring probably right in the middle of the Hyksos, which seems uh, unlikely somehow. Uh, assuming that that's the case, yeah, you're looking at a Hyksos exodus. Now, to be fair, John Bimson argued for a Hyksos exodus. So maybe he's on to something. Yeah. I'm sure you're itching to comment on this. Well, just one quick comment. <laughs> Josephus, who is 2,000 years closer to these events than we are, approximately, um, definitely puts the exodus from Egypt during the Hyksos period. Now, he calls them the shepherd people, the Hyksos were. And, but when you see how he describes these um, rulers in Egypt, um, definitely it's a reference to Hyksos. I'm not sure if Josephus actually uses the word Hyksos. Maybe you can refresh my mind on that. Um, I, I think you may be right. That but the context of his statement shows this is the Hyksos period. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's where Bimson may be going. I don't know where else he gets his uh, information from. I, I think one of the arguments that he was making was that there were some people who were saying that uh, Jericho had fallen, but too early for early bronze. Mm -hmm. And so one of the arguments is that Jericho actually fell during middle bronze, uh, late middle bronze, which would be the Hyksos period. And so that's the connection he made, and it's actually not directly having to do with Santorini. Um, Santorini just happens to fit into this plot very nicely. Now, to give you a little geological context of the uh, Santorini eruption, I think it was just about 20 years ago in the early 1990s, there was a paper at a geological con conference, uh, GSA Geological Society of America conference in Orlando. And the title of the paper was something like uh, The Eruption of Santorini and Biblical Connections. Well, immediately when I go to a professional geological <laughs> meeting, <laughs> there's any biblical connections, I went. And there was a huge auditorium. There was kind of standing room only, uh, as I recall. Which is not surprising given the subject. A lot of geologists are evangelical Christian or are raised with a Christian background, so they wanted to see what this guy said. Well, uh, I think it was, um, not sure if it was D.J. Stanley, but he was a marine oceanographer, and he's done a lot of work on the Mediterranean, and they were drilling in the delta of Egypt, and they found a layer, unusual layer, of a lot of ash. And so they analyzed the composition, the ash, and it, there was a connection with the Hyksos ash at that time period. So this is one case where they actually did do the geochemical analysis yeah. that you were asking about. That's a good point. So um, he, he was saying that, you know, here we are, more than 500 miles away from this island that he erupted. So it was a big boom, a big banger, really big, uh, to have the ash travel all the way to Egypt. He was thinking airfall ash. At the end of his talk, he read from the book of Exodus about the Egyptian darkness during the plague of darkness. And the Bible says the darkness was so thick it could be felt. And so he was saying that Volcanic ash is something you would feel in the air. And so that was his biblical connection. He didn't elaborate further. And then he had a big slide of the Israelites leaving Egypt with a big volcanic eruption in the background. So that 
that made a big splash 20 years ago. and Maybe Bimson was connecting that together with Santorini. I don't know. And if you connect Santorini with Hyksos period, like the archaeologists are doing with some of the pottery, because they have, um, you know, Theron pottery mm -hmm. from that era is found at Tel El Daba. Yeah. And within a secure archaeological context, and it's pushing the date back 150 years if you can trust pottery dates. That's a whole other issue. Right. We and probably don't want to get into. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a problem. Now, one of the interesting things, and we're just, I'm doing this on the fly, so I haven't explored okay. this yet, but let's suppose you, you say this is 1600, and you go back 430 years, uh, that puts you nicely in the early 12th dynasty. And there are famine inscriptions from the 12th dynasty, specifically the reign of Sesostris I. So if you want to, you can, uh, you can make that case. Just, uh, you know, uh, that, that of course assumes that the 430 years were solely in Egypt and, and not as the Apostle Paul would have it, uh, uh, starting from Abraham and the promise. Um, and also, I think Josephus has it split as well. Um, but, that's a, but that's just an interesting point. Now, I, I see that our time is uh, up now, uh, but those of you who want to stay for a little bit are welcome to make further comments at this point. I have some more comments if, um, if anyone wants to stay to listen. I know the roasts will stay. <laughs> I did not know what I was going to say until, uh, until the, last night. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, on the the plagues, uh, there is there is an attempt to try and get a naturalistic explanation of the plagues. Yes, as you there know. is. Uh huh. And there's a book by a dendrochronologist from Belf, not Belfast. Did the river yeah, turn to blood because it was that was the uh, time of year that a certain bacteria could live? And exactly. And then the frogs All jumped that, out because the river turned the to urine, blood. urine. Maybe there was. And extra then rain during the, the summer. Yeah. Uh, there's a Michael Bailey who wrote a book from Exodus to Arthur. He's somewhat of a catastrophist. He's looking for impacts by meteors and meteorites and impacts of comets and wh what they might do to uh, human history. In Exodus to Arthur, he believes the time of King Arthur, some of the unusual phenomena there can be described as a cometary impact. So, you know, that's speculation. It's hard to, to uh, tie it all together. So there is a scholarly attempt to try and tie the exodus with something that happened physically that can be documented through volcanoes and so on. Now, I have, a, I have my own theory, and Maybe sometime I'll have a chance to elaborate further. But uh, if we take just one statement by one historian, Sincillus, now he lived during the Christian era, so after the time of Augustine. So he's uh, fairly late, but he's... Is he a Christian historian? He was a Christian yeah, historian, okay. yeah. And um, his writings have been preserved in Latin. And he gives us the name of the pharaoh of the Exodus, and it's Apophis. A-P-O-P-H-I-S. Now, interesting, you can go to the ancient names, the Greek names of the mm -hmm. pharaohs, because they all had Greek names given to them. And there is an Apophis who ruled for 60 years, and he's the last great Hyksos king. And so if we have this one line of evidence, if there's any truth in it, we might want to put Joseph there and say that Josephus was confused between 
the exodus out of Egypt and the exodus into Egypt. So maybe he merged the two events together. I don't know. So that's a theory that I hope some people can look into. Well, if, if the exodus is involved with Santorini, uh, then you're looking at... Uh, and, and the other thing is to keep in mind is that we don't know what's going to happen to the calibration curve. Um, there are there are people who theorize uh, that we've got that all nailed down and can just go home, um, but the data that I'm getting from Nineveh I think calls that into question. And if we continue to find the same offset with other uh, Assyrian dates, I think we're we will be at a point where we have to reconstruct the calibration curve as well. And if that happens, then if, if all we do is move things 150 years earlier, that 1600 becomes kind of close to 1445. Mm -hmm. um, in which case, uh, maybe that 1500 isn't that far off. <laughs> and uh, uh, with the calibration curve, maybe we need to bring things down further. The only problem with that is that there's apparently a uh, Tel Adaba. It's supposed to have the uh, the Hyksos and the New Kingdom all lined up the way they're supposed to. Um, so either somebody's got uh, they've got erroneous associations, or else there's uh, uh, I mean. Santorini can't interrupt both in the second intermediate period in the New Kingdom. It just can't. Mm -hmm. And so either Tel Adaba is erroneously associated with the rest of Egypt or else the or else the rest of Egypt needs to come down to the to Tel Adaba dates, carbon fourteen dates, in which case well it's still erroneously associated with the rest of Egypt. I don't know that you really have much choice but to say that uh, that that uh, Tel Adaba uh, chronology's correlation with Egypt is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whether it's the rest of Egypt or whether it's Tel Adaba that's wrong, it's not clear. But the correlation is wrong, some way. Uh, three or four weeks back, we talked about the Israelite house. Um, is it a three-room or four-room house? Yes. They first appear at Tel El Damba. Tel El Damba has that kind of house, and um, there's a strong connection with Semites uh, from the pottery and so on. So there may be a biblical connection with the Israelites there, and it's in the Delta. Yeah. That's a good place for Israelites to be, and they came out of the Delta. So the, unfortunately, I can't come to you and tell you that I have all the answers. But I think I can safely say that nobody else has all the answers either. Right. We wouldn't believe you anyway. <laughs> <laughs>